Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're just running through our uh, last minute live video checks to see that we are streaming to our website as well. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. We're going to be starting the podcast in just a moment. Uh, we will be interviewing a few wonderful researchers from this entomology conference live during the program and the interviews should last about 15 minutes but there will be an opportunity for one or two questions from the audience once the uh once our portion of the interview is over there's a microphone that is right over there if you want to if you have questions please step up to the mic and um, ask questions into the microphone because then they go into our recording. And if you just ask them from your seat, we may not actually hear you later. Um, let's see, so this is a live podcast recording and we are going to be starting. Yeah? Let's yeah. Do let's do this. All right, I believe our recording is over there. Make sure I'm going to the right rundown. All right. Are we good? Okay. Starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 643.5. Recorded on Monday, November 6th. 2017, live from Entomology 2017. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we will fill your heads with baby eyes, embalming licks, and ant self-control. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. For those unfamiliar with entomology, the definition of entomology is a branch of zoology that deals with insects. And while the etymology of entomology agrees that it is the study of insects, it is not uncommon for an entomologist to study spiders, scorpions, mites, or ticks, despite the fact that these are not insects, but arachnids. And then there are the myriapods, centipedes, millipedes, and other multi-legged critters also studied by entomologists. But there is a terminology that includes insects, arachnids, and myriapods. Arthropoda, poda. <laughs> and whether you like the way arthropoda logical rolls off the tongue or prefer the long standardized entomological, the following episode of Twist is crawling with sciencey news. As we are broadcasting from the open circulatory system of bug researchers, the 65th annual meeting of the Entomological Society of America in Denver, Colorado, here on This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn yeah, everything I want to do dance is dancing is discoveries that happen every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know And, Blair. and good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there, especially those of you in our live audience here at Entomology 2017. Oh, we have a wonderful show laid out for you today here at the Entomological Society of America's annual meeting in Denver, Colorado. The show is made possible by the generous efforts of Joanna Elsenson and Rob Dunn and the Entomological Society of America, and they've gotten us here, and we are thrilled to be here. Thank you for joining us live today. All right, our show today, it's full of guest interviews. Normally we have lots of stories, but today we're talking to lots of people, which is just exciting. We're gonna be chatting about evolution, ecology, and conservation of insect species galore, and the whole show is completely tuned to the key of entomology. And this, this is my bad joke. B. <laughs> yeah, 
gratuitous laughter inserted here. <laughs> All right, on this week's show, I have a new story about things that we can learn about fear from watching babies. Justin, what do you have? Uh, embalming licks. And Blair, what do you have? Oh, I have ants and uh, their ability to, you know, restrain themselves from things. <laughs> restraint and yeah. restraint. Self restraint in ants. Right. Um, our guests today are going to be Dr. Jessica Ware, also M Raul Medina, and Martha Reiskin, and we will be introducing them each individually as they come onto the show to be grilled, tested <laughs> about their knowledge. You know, that's what we're going to be doing here. Um, before we jump into all of that, though, I want to remind everyone that you can subscribe to the Twist Podcast. All good places where podcasts are found. On the iTunes portal, the, podcast, the Google Play podcast portal, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. You can find us looking for This Week in Science. Just visit twist.org. Hey everyone. Okay, let's jump into some science. So who's afraid of spiders? Anyone in here afraid of spiders? Yeah, this is probably the wrong crowd to ask that question. I am a little bit. Blair says she's a little afraid of spiders, and it has been tested previously that um, there is a large percentage of entomologists who are actually afraid of spiders, even though you might not admit it in public. <laughs> but a new study came out in the last couple of weeks in Frontiers in Psychology, and I wanted to kind of set, up, set the stage for our evolutionary perspective on entomology with this story today, researchers looked at six-month-old infants and how they reacted to pictures of flowers versus spiders or snakes versus other nice things. So the question was, was there an innate fear re response. There have been studies previously that showed that little babies as young as seven months old have a noradrenergic, this is part of their stress system, a noradrenergic response to fearful faces. And they can measure that by pupillary dilation, so how big the pupils get. If, and, and it's not really fear, but arousal that's being that's actually being me measured. And so historically, they've been able to show that seven-month-old infants, when they see fearful faces, have increased pupillary dilation. They're aroused by these looks of fear on other people's faces. So the question was, what if not faces, but actually images of things that people are afraid of? How does the baby respond to that? So they took six-month-old infants, and measured pupillary response to flowers versus spiders and these snakes and, 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 and fish. So fish, fish aren't so scary. They flop around a bit, right? But snakes, ooh, I, I don't know. Some people love snakes. Some people love spiders. So this is a, is it a, is it a learned response or is it innate? And that is the big question. Wait, wait, before you, before you tell us the, the answer. Uh-huh. Um, so my, I have a four-year-old who is absolutely fearless of, she'll pick spiders up in the house and take them outside. Uh, at the pet store, she, they had these, these folks that would let you hold the mice, and she'd just hold the mice and just, you know, totally thought they were adorable, until she found out her sister was afraid of these things. And now she's like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to touch, go anywhere near that spider, or I don't want to hold it. But she really did have to learn it from her sister, because mm -hmm. she had no fear of any of these things. Right, so, I don't know, maybe according to this, Study? Your four-year-old is an outlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it turns out the majority of these six-month-old babies have a pupillary dilation that's highly significant in response to these fearful images of spiders or snakes versus the things that are kind of innocuous and not really threatening at all. So there may be, I mean, this doesn't mean that the babies are afraid their pupils dilated, it just means they're aroused, that this is something they go, oh, I should pay attention to this versus not pay attention to something else. Um, and so this suggests that there is an innate pathway within the human psyche to be prepared potentially for threatening stimuli. So spiders, 
Mm-hmm. We're just afraid of them. Yeah, and the, the thing that I would wonder about with that is that here in the United States, for example, there are not that many venomous snakes, and there are a lot less actually spiders that are dangerous to humans here than perhaps on other continents. So is this something that starts way back in our evolutionary history when there were a lot more life-threatening spiders and snakes than we have to deal with here? Which is the thing that I always deal with, especially in California where I teach kids about snakes, where I'm always having to tell them that in California there's only one species of snake that you have to worry about. Rattlesnake. The rattlesnake, and it tells you where it is, right? So... Mm -hmm. To, be, to have this innate fear of snakes is not necessarily an evolutionary advantage in some places, especially because snakes and spiders are p- pest control. Absolutely. So a uh, desire to so, so how did, kind so, of extricate yourself from those animals might actually be a problem. So Blair, you used to be terrified of spiders. Terrified. If there was a spider have... in the room and I did not see it get removed, um, I would not go into the room for days, right. including and my so, bedroom and, as a and, child. But this is also coming from the same person who wants to, to create wallpaper of jumping spiders. Correct. To <laughs> yes. Her out. So, my head's so a mess, did, what can I say? <laughs> so how did yes. you overcome this? How did I overcome it? Actually, by learning about them. That was, that was ultimately it, was finding out more about these animals, why they're important, the fact they're not dangerous, education, and diving into the science of these animals' life history and all this kind of stuff. That was the key to me, because it wasn't this weird, creepy, crawly thing moving in a way I didn't understand that was, that was dangerous. It was a thing that had a job in my house. And a good job. And some of those jumping spiders, as we've seen from the entomology conference, have really nice eyelashes yeah. from the calendar that we all got. There's some great little jumping spiders in and there. I, and I actually probably offend somebody here, but I convinced my daughter that spiders were okay, my four-year-old, to, to allow them to you know, sort of not be afraid. Of, because the one thing she really can't stand is mosquitoes. So once I told her that, no, that's, this is what eats mosquitoes. This mm-hmm. is what's going to catch the errant mosquito that's going around our house is if the spider's allowed to, to remain with us. And so she became a lot more friendly towards the spiders again. That's fabulous. You know what it's time for now? I hope our guests have no fear because it's time for our first interview. I would like to welcome Dr. Jessica Ware up to the stage. Dr. Ware is an evolutionary biologist and entomologist. She is assistant professor at Rutgers University, Newark, studying the evolution of insect physiology and behavior, particularly particularly dragonflies and dicoptera, as well as their geographic distribution. And on an interview that uh, that she gave for our website once, she said she studies the evolution of insects through space and time. So you are like the Doctor Who of insect study. I actually am. Like one of my graduate students one time made a slide for me with the Doctor Who logo changed to Doctor Where. It was my most beloved slide gift anyone ever gave me. <laughs> I'm a Doctor Who fan. I'm a Whovian. Perfect. Yep. This is great. So tell us a little more about what you and your lab focus on. So we, as you mentioned, we work on dragonflies and damselflies, but we also look at dictyopter, which are the termites and cockroaches. Praying mantises are also in the dictyopter, but that's what Gavin Svensson's lab works on. We're really interested in different aspects of, of phylogeny, how you could use phylogeny to ask questions about behavior and ecology. So um, in dragonflies, we're really interested in flight behavior and migration, in, in the way that they mate, the way that their naughty bits kind of connect to each other. That's an interesting question for our lab. We were just talking about yeah. that last night. Blair. Yeah, because they make but, that heart. The, the copulatory wheel, yeah, it's really romantic when you yes. think about it um, from that perspective, but what the male is actually doing in that heart shape is actually scraping out the previous male sperm, and so it makes it less romantic when you think about right. it that way, I think. Right. Well, I, think a, I think a man who cleans up around the place is probably, you know, that's, that's a desirable quality. Yeah. This is where the shin kicking comes in. So please continue. <laughs> well, for termites, we have a slightly different question that we ask. For termites, actually, as an aside, if there are graduate students who are interested in copulatory behavior, in mating behavior, we don't know a lot about how termites do what they do in terms of making progeny, um, how the parts fit together. But what we work on in my lab is looking at differences among termites and what they eat. We always think of termites just as being wood feeders, but there's actually a whole bunch of termites that are in the group called the lower termites, 
that, gra- that are grazers. So they feed on grass. And they have different mandibles, different teeth structure that's related to the food that they eat. Um, and they have endosymbionts. They have things that live inside their hindgut that help them digest their food. And that varies, predictably, with the type of food that they're eating. Right. Mm. So you've got termites that feed on wood sources. And so the cellulose that's hard to digest, you probably need some kind of bacterial species to be able to assist th- with that. And that would vary depending on how difficult that cellulose is to break down? Uh, well, perhaps. I mean, there's a lot of work that's been done looking at, at the fact that the bacteria and protists, there's also protists, which Jillian Giles' lab works on at the, in Arizona, that seems to evolute to to vary among species in a phylogenetic way, right? So there's a lot of things that get passed down, and they do proctodial trophallaxis, where nestmates, well, that's a fancy word to say that they're just drinking anal secretions from a nestmate, as one does. Um, <laughs> right. That, so they're kind of like constantly recolonizing mm-hmm. their gut with these bacteria and protists, and so they kind of are local effects of the species that you see. But there's a lot of, that's kind of a lot of work that other labs are working on. Great. Mm-hmm. So, Dragonflies, cockroaches, termites, these are not, I mean, aside from being insects, they're not closely related within that. So how did you come to, I mean, you love Odonata. I love them. You love the Odonata. You're on so (laughs) many boards and you're supporting the Odonata of the world. How did you move from dragonflies and a love of dragonflies into studying cockroaches and termites, these things that so many people are like... (laughs) Ah, yuck, <laughs> what? There's a cockroach in my cupboard. It's not clean, you know? It's funny how they're so different. Like, when you talk about dragonflies, everybody says, oh, I've got a dragonfly tattoo, which is always, always an antlion, because it has the wrong antennae. But they're like, oh, I've got a dragonfly tattoo, or I've got dragonfly earrings. No one says that for termites and cockroaches, right? No, right. There's always disdain mm-hmm. and, like, a negative visceral reaction. But I got interested in them, actually, when I was a graduate student doing like a term paper on Dictyoptera um, for my entomology class. And I was committed to doing, you know, Odonata um, for my thesis work. But the paper that I ended up working on was looking at how outgroup selection in a phylogeny, you have to have the taxa that you want to study um, and some close relatives. And I looked at how that varied, um, whether or not we thought praying mantises, termites, or cockroaches were more closely related. Mm-hmm. And I kind of got hooked. And so after that, I did a postdoc where I looked at termites, and termites have a really neat fossil record, um, and so that kind of got me hooked, too. Yeah. Right, fossil record. So let's get into the, the question of studying the evolution of these insects, you know, more into this time and space aspect of, you know, of how insects are moving from one place to another and one form to another. It's really, it's an exciting time to be studying insects because we think we are getting close to understanding the true tree of insects, the true kind of relationships of how the different orders are related to each other. And once you know how they're related, you can then start asking questions about when they diversified, when these speciation events took place. Dragonflies are really great because they're at the base of the insect tree, right? So before there were bats, before there were pterosaurs, before there were birds, there were dragonflies flying around. Weren't they giant? Like giant dragonflies? Well, there were these things. They're not real (laughs) dragonflies, but they're pretty close cousins. They're called proto-odonates by some people. Um, And these things have, you know, 70 centimeter wingspans, but they're not, those are not the real dragonflies that we see flying around today. The crown, um, the, the modern dragonflies are only about 250 million years old. So much younger than these giant ones that were flying in the Carboniferous around 350 million years ago. But they did the kind of similar thing, you know, they were hunting in the air, um, but at a time when those giant um, proto were flying, all they had to eat was each other, right? So there weren't a lot of things flying around. And what we think is that they were probably pretty clumsy flyers. And if you look at wing venation in dragonflies and damselflies, it can tell you something about flight behavior because certain wing venation patterns are correlated with certain styles of flight. Huh. So we think that these big, like, proto were just kind of paddling through very viscous air. But when birds and frogs came on the scene, dragonflies had to get really fast at everything that they did and be really good at maneuvering. So we see like a change in wing venation, a change in flight behavior. Um, So modern dragonflies have a variety of of flight behaviors and some of them can turn on a dime. They have really good maneuverability, which we think those older, you know, carboniferous things probably couldn't. Right, Evan Rude. (laughs) Sorry, Sorry. hearkening back to old Disney movies. So the, the, the morphology of these insects is really important. It, 
because the structure begets function and how they can actually survive and fly in their environments. Um, you're working a lot now also on the genomic aspect. So not just the structural aspect, but the, in, the internal instructions that make that structure. And so how are you looking at that and how is that actually influencing, or how is it benefiting your research? That's a really interesting question. So most of the work that we've done for odinates for dragonflies in my lab has looked at transcriptomics. And so that can tell us something about the types of genes that were expressed at the time when we squashed these guys, when we killed them. Um, but we haven't done a lot of work kind of um, yet teasing apart what the actual genes are. Most of the genes that we know that we've been using for phylogenetics or for phylogenomics have been housekeeping genes. So, but there's a lot of, there's, there's like a whole field of diamonds there that people just need to kind of pick up and, and use um, to kind of ask questions about color and vision, to ask questions about oxfos genes, to ask questions about, you know, genes that are related with flight or immune response. Dragonflies and damselflies are victims of mites. So you talked about mites before. We hate them because they cover dragonflies and damselflies. They get covered in them and it blocks their genitalia. So that elicits some type of immune that response. That might be a problem. Yeah, yeah pick the crown on it. You know, it's not great in the in the pond circle. Um, so we want to try and like look at uh, use tra the transcriptomic information that we have for ask other questions about genes that are related to to these phenomena. Cool, and so. What are you doing moving forward, looking at look, using these tools of the phylogenomics, the transcript, transcriptomics, and what are you, how are you moving forward and trying to move the field forward? Well, I mean, for dragonflies and damselflies, what we're trying to do is it's a really small order. So there's, you'll hear talks today where people will stand up, graduate students, I'm so impressed, and they're working on groups that have 100,000 individuals, 100,000 species. There's 6,000 total species in Odonata. So our real, it's a realistic goal that we'll be able to have at least transcriptomic information for all of these species, but hopefully have more genomic information if we could, we could finish this order, you know, and have it and know everything about them um, in terms of their physiology, their genes, their genomics, that's a realistic goal, I think, in our lifetime. And that's just for living, for extant species of, of these odonates. Yeah, they have a yeah. really good fossil record. So there's lots of odonates that, um, that are stem taxa, there are stem lineages, um, and there's a whole group of people that are working at the Paris Museum and at places in Germany and France um, that are you know, specializing on, on the, fossil, the fossil taxa. And looking at the fossil, the fossil taxa, how do you do that? Is it the same thing? I mean, I know with human fossils or with you know, our homo ancestors, going back and we're being able to gather blood cells or DNA from the bones that's been preserved. Is it the same kind of process? Well, for dragonflies and damselflies, they, um, it's a bit of a different process. Usually what we have are fragmented pieces of wing venation. Um, and most of the wing venation is pretty diagnostic, and you can kind of pin it down to at least a family. And there are certainly lots of fossils that we have that go right to the species level. We can't really do much more than that. Most of the compression fossils, all you can do is really morphology. We do have samples that are in, that are in amber. Um, about 10 years ago, there was only 20 um, odonates that were in amber, and 19 of those were, were damselflies, but since then there's been a large deposit that's been found in China, and there's you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples of, of odonates that are in amber. Some of the amber you can actually dissolve with chemical solvents, and so maybe they'll be able to do some types of dissections with that with that work um, that Jarzembowski is doing, and that, that's kind of an exciting time. Um, and you know, uh, termites, we mostly have compression fossils um, that we're working with. And termites are really just kind of bags of goo. When you take out the mandibles, you can't see the mandibles in the fossil. It just kind of looks like a squashed bag of goo uh, that's in this compression fossil. But um, there's some stuff that you can do with termite fossils, too. Yeah, hopefully that bag of goo has individual components that once you can get into <laughs> the molecular and chemical aspects of it, you can tease it apart a little bit. Yeah, that's just true. <laughs> and so with these, the amber fossils, we're going to have, it's going to be, Jurassic Park with dragonflies. <laughs> that would be great. That's our dream, right? If we could, re we could we resurrect that. Meganura, then I think many people will be very disappointed on their Sunday picnics with their these giant <laughs> things moving around. It'll probably eat a lot of bugs, though. Yeah. And finally, for our questions, in terms of your study of entomology and insects, not just the insects that you study, but looking at it from an evolutionary perspective. Why is this study important? 
Well, pretty much every talk that's at this conference um, that you're going to hear has some basis that's rooted in evolution, whether it's integrated pest management, whether it's uh, some of the biotechnology talks. All of the things that we're discussing have a fundamental basis in, in evolution and understanding how the different species that have these different concepts or phenomena that people are talking about they're all related to each other, and the phylogenetic history um, of these organisms really kind of underlines every question that every person is asking. So if you go to a biocontrol talk, one thing that you might wonder is, how are the species that are invasive pests related to each other? So evolution kind of is an undercurrent for all of our, all of our work that we do in the Anthropological Society of America. So having a strong insect phylogeny, really understanding how you know, different orders are related to each other, families, genus, species, that's, it's, it behooves us all. It, it, really, mm-hmm. it, it behooves us to, to take a look at that and to really put that into each of our studies. And you have also, you've spoken at the March for Science, and so are an outspoken proponent <laughs> of um, entomological science um, in general. And do you, do you think it's going to be difficult to continue to reach out, or do you think it's getting easier to tell the stories of insects to the public and get them interested in what you do? Well, I certainly think that with social media, um, it's a lot easier to get insect messages out. I think that if you um, have a social media presence, you're able just to slip, you know, mostly dragonfly photos, but you can slip some cockroach photos in there. (laughs) Just start slipping in cockroach photos and termites. And before you know it, you've kind of desensitized the person, I hope, um, for this negative visceral reaction that most cockroaches elicit. So I think I'm optimistic for the future of, uh, for those of us who work on, on things that make you feel itchy, like lice and bed bugs and cockroaches and, mm-hmm. and termites. You know, hopefully we, we have kind of a captive audience in our Twitter feed that we can kind of, you know, provide a little bit of the, the love story behind these things, right? The, so you heard it here, dragonflies, the gateway insect. It's a gateway. Here we go. <laughs> that would be actually really handy. My, in my hometown, we have these <clears throat> very large outdoor cockroaches that are just, they cover the sidewalks usually in the evening. And yeah, and you go walking and they go crunch, crunch, crunch <laughs> under your feet. But it would be really nice, I mean, you sort of do get desensitized to them being out there in the environment, but it would also be nice to have like a little bit more of a love story about your, yeah. you know, about your local yeah. fa- uh, community cockroach so that you could feel good, maybe step around yeah. a few of them. <laughs> I'm also really fascinated by this proto-oda being its own prey. Like that's like how does how does that ecosystem survive? Did they also start out in the water and then come above, or is it? Yeah, presumably. I mean, all odonates, and we think the proto-odonates as well had their larval, you know, stages in the water, or the naiad, nymph, juvenile. We had a whole debate about that in an earlier session today. People call the the juvenile stages different things than odonates, but anyways, they they have aquatic stages, and presumably that's what proto-odonates had as well. And that's probably um, why you'd want to stay in the water as long as possible, because <laughs> as soon as you came up, you were you were eating. Just... And even for modern dragonflies, I mean, modern dragonflies cannibalize each other constantly. Wow. So many of the many of the times when you go out to the field to catch dragonflies and you go to catch them, they've got things in their mouth. It's... So often it's flies and things, but. But many times it's damselflies, it's dragonflies. They're really good at eating each other, and it's a really good source. I mean, <laughs> dragonflies, if you're ever you know, in a bad situation and you need to have some food meal, go for a dragonfly, because that flight muscle is really thick. Yeah. It's got a lot of protein. They have good fat stores, so um, that's a good one to consume. Have you eaten a dragonfly? I have eaten a dragonfly, oh. um, and they're not bad. You know, you, the muscle of the thorax is pretty good. There's actually a guy at the American Museum of Natural History, Lou Sorkin, who is very into entomophagy, and he's tried to feed us, I think, every kind of, of insect that there is. <laughs> I think the farthest I've gone is mealworm powder. You know, oh. the flower, like make cookies out of the yeah. flower. That's we ate mealworms it. last uh, oh, June we, when we, we did. were in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, we ate mealworms. It tasted kind of nutty. Yeah, yeah. We're good. yeah. yeah. Does anybody Somebody have any from questions audience. from the audience? I'd love to, if anyone has any comments or questions for Dr. Ware, we have a microphone if you'd like to step up to the mic. Everyone's going to stare at the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to come up. Did you have another? Yeah, no, just that that, uh, that might be counterproductive if you were collecting and finding it to be a good snack at the same time. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I, should have, I should have brought a lunch. I'm going to have to go back out to the field now. <laughs> My food yeah. is consumed. Yeah, we don't actually eat. I mean, I've never had been compelled to eat cockroaches or, or termites for some reason, even though I know, I mean, I have like a lot of information in my brain that mm-hmm. should tell my right. psyche it's all right. Um, I, you know, there's, you know, 
uh, only 2% of cockroach species are pests. Usually the bacteria that are coating them, um, they get from kind of being around humans. Um, so the things like salmonella that we would want to worry about probably aren't going to be at my field site in the middle of the jungle in Guyana, but I just don't feel compelled to eat them. <laughs> dragonflies, I don't know, it just seems like it's an easier sell. Yeah. I love the dragonflies. I will eat the dragonflies. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually how I got into, into entomology in a way, uh, was that my Nana was an outdoors person. And so she always was trying to point out different things that you could eat if you were in trouble. Like she assumed we were going to have this bad luck befall us uh, in the Canadian wilderness. And so dragonflies are one of them. You heard it here, you guys. Mm -hmm. Dragonflies in a pinch if you're hungry. Dr. Ware, thank you so much for, you for joining us. Me. This has been great <laughs> talking with you. Thank you so much. And you can find information about Dr. Ware's research at her website and also her Twitter account at Jessica Ware Lab. Uh, JessicaWareLab.com is her website if you want to find out more about what she does, get in touch with her, talk with her about dragonflies, cockroaches, termites. I don't know. I think, I think termites pretty cool things. This is This Week in Science, and we are moving on with the show. Justin, what'd you bring? Ah, uh, if you are a bee, you spend much of your time <clears throat> buzzing about from flower to flower in search of nectar, gathering pollen, back to the hive and out again, over and over again, 40-ish times a day, and life is good. You're a good worker bee from a respectable hive, and you have your whole life ahead of you. The world is your nectary. You take a moment to contemplate the wonderful niche you're filling. Nutrients to the hive, pollination to the plants, honey for this suddenly, without warning, bam, digger wasp. You are stung. Worse, you are paralyzed, dragged from the sunlit world into an underground brood chamber. You've heard the stories, but nothing can prepare you for what comes next. Not only does the wasp cover you in eggs, but it begins licking you all over. Turns out, it's damp underground in the world of the digger wasp, and the best way to preserve prey from soil fungi is to lick on it. And, by doing so, cover them with a film of digger wasp hydrocarbons. Most insects have some form of hydrocarbons on their skin that protects them from fungal infestation, but that of bees is not as well adapted to soil fungi as those of digger wasps, so digger wasp covers the bee in a better preservative film to ensure that it's still there for the larva when they need it. New findings from the Biocenter University of Würzburg show that the composition of the protective layer varies according to the type of prey and the brood care strategy in digger wasps. Team of Professor Thomas Schmidt reports on these findings in the journal Evolution. Turns out beetles have their own natural resistance to the fungi. And because of this, they don't require so much licking by the wasps. So in areas where the wasps are preying on beetles, they don't lick them because they don't need it. I love the licking. This bee, the digger wasp saliva is embalming fluid. It's embalming mm -hmm. them. Yeah. <laughs> it's embalming them. And this is Quoty voice uh, from, from the professor. Uh, uh, where was it? Um, the surface of beetles is much harder than that of bees and wasps, and in moist soil it takes fungi much longer to infest a beetle. So the beetle hunting digger wasps do not have to embalm their prey from laying the eggs to the hatching of the larva to protect them against the fungi. They can have the effort of embalming and no longer need highly effective embalming cocktails. As a result, their hydrocarbon profiles have become more diversified during this evolution. In fact, the beetle hunting digger wasps each have much more species-specific hydrocarbon profiles. And this in spite of the fact that the examined species are much more closely related to each other than other digger wasps that hunt bees and wasps. So we talk on the show all the time about how we have different uh, bacteria in our gut for different food that we eat. And so there's this, um, there's different species specific, individual specific, these different things that we have that, that help us eat, prey on whatever it is we're going to eat. But this is a whole different level. This is a lot more than just the biota that you're carrying around. This is an ingrained change in structures. 
Absolutely, it's very interesting. Yeah, and then using it for an external, like the how the prey itself is evolving the wasps, necessity of creating this mm -hmm. the, this licking hydrocarbon activity. Yeah, so you've got the digger digger wasps that all prey on the on bees and flies that don't necessarily have hydrocarbons themselves. And so their, their profile, their hydrocarbons that are found on the skin, are, they're relatively similar. So they're kind of, they're, they have little differences, but they're relatively similar across the board, across space. Because these, these wasps can be in different environments, but they're all preying on these bees. But then the digger wasps who prey on the beetles their profiles have become really unique because they're not making, they, they don't have these specialized cells anymore, or they do, but they're not creating those hydrocarbons that are used for embalming. So they're just, right. they're we, becoming much more unique in their profiles and thus maybe easier to identify. And this is, this is an diversification. Yeah. yeah, an interesting diversification uh, point where we, we look at this a lot of times and we try to figure out how the, the arms races between insects or other predator prey relationships start. How they, how they begin. And in, this is kind of a good example of one where the normal method in which it would be using to embalm, because that's not necessary, it begins to experiment. It can, it can sort of use that energy and resource to try other things. So this is a case energy of, and resource, yeah. of the digger wasps developing this potentially across the board evolutionarily, and then this specific group lost the behavioral and the biological adjustment Mm -hmm. um, because of this new food source. And now they can go do other things and they can use that energy that would be used to create the hydro hydrocarbons. They can use the, those materials that would be used to create those hydrocarbons for other uses. Yes, absolutely. Other per repurposing. The diversity of, of yeah. resistances now. Yeah. Digger wasp, does a diversification. I love it. And it's all in their skin, in their coating. Yes. So what's in our saliva is not necessarily all over our skin. Well, what's in our saliva is going to be a lot, <laughs> I don't know. Did you brush your teeth? <laughs> There's going to be a lot of microbes in there for us. That's true. Microbe enzymes. makeup is probably pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Possibly. a lot of overlap. Yeah, I don't know. That would be interesting. The next thing to check is whether or not microbes are similar across these digger wasps as well, possibly. Mm -hmm. Does anyone need a grad school research project? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have quite a few ideas before we're done today. That's so. right. Every show, we come up with lots of potential re research projects for people. Yeah. I would love, in the name of diversification, to bring up our next guest, Dr. Raul Medina. Please come up to the stage. <laughs> Hello. Dr. Medina is a professor in the t at Texas A&M at the School of Agriculture and Life Sciences in the Department of Entomology, and his research interests center around the role that ecological factors play in the population genetics of arthropods, particularly the incorporation of evolutionary ecology considerations into pest control practices. All right, so tell us in a little more detail than what I've just said, what you focus on in your lab. What is your research? Well, that was perfect, <laughs> but I can go into more detail. Uh, what I'm interested about specifically is how um, the association, the ecology of uh, insects, in particular their interactions with uh, their hosts, because I study parasites. So how the interaction of insects with their hosts alter their population genetics. Uh, and I'm using hosts in a very, uh, and parasites in a very broad uh, sense. So I consider uh, herbivore insects uh, parasites of plants. So I study insect herbivores as parasites of plants. Huh. And I also yeah, I study uh, uh, insects that attack animals, uh, for example, ticks uh, uh, as parasites of animals. So I'm very interested in seeing how the interactions with uh, parasite hosts affect their genetics and how the processes that affect insects that attack plants uh, compared to the ones of insects attacking animals. Right, so I'm, I'm fascinated by this, the, the, the parsing of the language itself too, having come from this idea we have predator prey, and then parasites are this completely different category than the simple predator prey makeup. So can you talk a little bit more about how you've come to this? 
Well, uh, it's basically because I see things a little bit uh, from a population genetics uh, standpoint. So for me, it's just uh, sets of genomes interacting with different sets of genomes to get resources from them. And for me, that's a parasitic interaction. I know people that study parasites perhaps are, will be a little bit upset with me, <laughs> but that's how I see it. Yeah. Uh, and what I'm very interested in is, for example, seeing how when you have what is called for a generalist herbivore, for example, mm -hmm. how in reality, um, uh, we have a bunch of different genotypically distinct populations interacting with genotypically distinct populations of plants. So genotypically distinct populations of insects interacting with genotypically distinct populations of plants. And I, uh, what I'm really interested about is how genetically distinct populations differ in traits that are relevant to their control. So because ultimately what I uh, want to emphasize or what, what I want to, I mean, now it's actually very obvious. At the beginning it wasn't, I mean, when you talk about IPM, which is integrated pest management, which is the new paradigm about controlling, uh, well, not the new, but the, the current paradigm of pest control, uh, people knew the importance of ecology in that paradigm, but it was a little bit difficult to explain the importance of evolution within that paradigm. Now that's changing. It's way better now than it was 20 years ago uh, in terms of the, and when I took, I mean, scientists knew this, but not the practitioners, not the growers, not the insecticide companies as much. Right. Now with the issue of insecticide resistance, I think it's very easy to explain how evolution can affect pest control practices and even uh, uh, resistance to genetically modified plants, which we are starting to see examples of, yeah. uh, have helped, helped to sell the importance of evolution in, um, in IPM. But basically, I mean, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but... <laughs> you but, are, it's great. And now, I mean, if you want to complicate things a little bit more, uh, you just talk about microbes, and that's uh, mm -hmm. something that I'm interested in studying as well. So when we say interactions, I'm talking about interactions about macroorganisms, so plants and insects, but also interac interactions among microorganisms within the insect body and among themselves, mm -hmm. and how these interactions might affect also the population genetics of the insects that host these microbes. Right, so, right. so like if, and I, we've had examples of this, talking about this before, about how the genetics of your household is you, maybe your spouse, and the family dog. That the, the skin microbes, the slab, that, that these things become integrated systems. So yeah, if there's a, if there's a parasite of an animal that also has a particular uh, microbe that lives on the animal's skin, the, the parasite's going to have to interact with this as well and have that, that incorporated. Yes, and also like we are we now thanks to the developments in our machines, the machines with which we uh, can uh, detect genomes within organisms. Well, now we know that a lot of insects have associations with bacteria that before we suspected they may have, but we didn't know. Now we can measure them. We can know who they are. And although a lot of those we cannot rear them, we can do correlations and see, for example, that many times insects that occur in, part, in some plants have a specific bacteria that facilitate that exploitation of that plant. So there are very famous yeah. examples, for example, the kutsu bug. The kutsu bug, uh, when acquiring a bacteria, um, Candidatus chicoella, it all of a sudden can feed on soybean. Without that bacteria, it cannot. So uh -huh. this is very important for what I study, because I study mm -hmm. how population genetics of insects allow them, you know, genetically the genetically distinct populations are able to fit on different host plants. But it turns out that it's not that's just the genome of the insect, but it's also the genome of the bacteria that live within insects, which allow them to do this thing. And I like to use the analogy of uh, insects, thinking of an insect like an iPhone, and of the bacteria like apps, <laughs> you know, that, that, that allow you to do certain things. So if you, I'm gonna download this app. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly I'll be able to eat soybeans. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, Absolutely. exactly. And it turns out that in aphids, for example, we have known this for a long time. We know that there are bacteria that allow them to uh, withstand high temperatures. There are bacteria that provide them resistance or protection against parasitoids. Uh, there are bacteria, even in, 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 in some insects, not necessarily aphids, but other insects, that people suspect allow them to uh, be resistant against uh, insecticides. Mm. So mm -hmm. turns out, uh, and there are bacteria, for example, that produce plant hormones that allow insects to feed on senescing leaves because they keep them green for, for longer. So we are starting to realize that a lot of things we thought were caused by the insect genome actually are caused by bacteria that live within these insects. Before we didn't know that because we couldn't measure them, we, could, we couldn't detect them or identify them, but now with uh, next generation sequencing, we have seen all these bacteria and some of them uh, were used to a lot of correlation, correlational studies and like kind of like mining from the studies of aphids. We actually have discovered that several insects have these uh, mutualisms and interactions that allow them to do amazing things, like increasing their host range, which is, for example. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, are we going to someday be able to use this information maybe to target the 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 microbes that exist within aphids and allow the aphids to eat my roses? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is that, are we going to be up, be able to apply this potentially instead of applying an insecticide? Is it going to? Are we going to target the microbes and their genetics? Or do we, or do we give up on the, uh, or do we give up on that that whole direction completely and just go to finding something that's going to eat the insect because that's going to be way too complicated to take on the microbe. Yeah, is it world. too complicated, or are we going to go? Are we going to be targeted? Yeah. Well, there is some people thinking about uh, exploiting these mutualistic re interactions between, particularly aphids, because the aphids we have we have we have a lot of information on aphids and their association with bacteria, for example, and there is a lot of people that have been studying the interactions of aphids and their, their bacteria with the idea of, at some point, use this knowledge for pest control. However, as you can imagine, I mean, the anti use of the antibiotics, for example, to kill these bacteria in pest control is extremely complicated. Uh, it's a no-no for several reasons. Uh, you know, they, they, I mean, several, all of them important, but just imagine about potential uh, uh, you know, that's yeah, that's we're that. already yeah, we're already having issues with antibiotic resistance mm -hmm. due to use in ranching exactly. and agriculture. Yeah, so yeah. applying it broadly to crops does not sound like a good idea. Yeah, so that's perfect. <laughs> not going to be the way in which this is going to be done. Uh, and is that is also the issue of the public and the public perception of antibiotics. I mean, regardless of the scientific validity or invalidity of this argument, it will be difficult to introduce. But the, but the study of the interaction can allow you to, for example, find receptors or targets. To, for gene editing, for example, like you could, if you actually know the mechanisms by which these bacteria associate with their insect host, you could use paratransgenic methods or, or uh, you know, like somehow modify the genetics of the insect to make them uh, um, unreceptive to this bacteria, some of which are fundamental for their survival. For example, in aphids, Bugnera fidicola, which is one of the main bacteria in, in aphids, without these bacteria, the aphids die. So if somehow you can make the bacteria, if it's uh, unable to host bacteria fidicola by genetically modifying the aphids, mm -hmm. uh, you will control aphids without actually use of antibiotics, but then you will be targeting their ability to host the bacteria. We have, I mean, this is theoretically possible, but we need much more study to identify which those receptors are and which mechanism will we use. But people have been using paratransgenesis, for example, in in mosquitoes, like against uh, you know dengue and things like this, are people is actually thinking uh, of using these methods for uh, parasites of animals and human disease. So it's something I think that's how the future of pest control is going to look like. I think actually we're at the beginning of the next phase of uh, pest control. So we're within the IPM paradigm, but I think we're going to enter into a phase of uh, genetic control that is going to be very interesting with the new developments in gene editing due to the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution. I think we're going to be able to do a lot of control. Right now, the only thing that uh, the, one of the main obstacles today is just regulation. So we need to think the way we are uh, regulating uh, our pest control methods and make them amenable to actually incorporate these new technologies because right now the regulatory system is not ready to take this, uh, but we need to have serious discussions as a nation and, and in, in scientific communities and circles to convince, convince our government um, to start thinking seriously about the pros and cons of these techniques. Uh, yeah. As all pest control methods, there is, it's not going to be 100% safe, yeah. uh, but we need to start evaluating if the benefits justify the risks and start putting numbers there and probabilities to do ecological risk assessments of uh, several things that we can now do with gene, gene editing, for example. But yeah. this is when all the knowledge, right, the ecological knowledge and evolutionary knowledge about entomology and their interactions with bacteria and their ability of the ability of genomes to combine in certain ways to fit on certain plants or not, on certain animals or not, all this information, all of a sudden, will be very important in order to incorporate these techniques within a context so we can actually assign probabilities to these um, potential novel control methods. Yeah. I mean, moving on from that, I mean, it, this is dealing with agriculture. This is dealing with the food that people are going to be eating. And so we've already run into problems communicating about genetic modification. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you foresee communication related to these additional genetic or transgenic CRISPR-Cas9 technologies that might be implemented as we move forward? I think actually that's one of the main challenges that uh, these, these techniques or these genetic studies uh, for pest control will have. I think the main challenge, I mean, there are scientific challenges, but nothing unusual for the kind of scientific challenges we have faced in the past as scientists. But the main challenge is going to be how do we translate 
uh, the benefits and risks to the public. Mm -hmm. Because I think, and I know some people might disagree with me, but I think that when we created uh, genetically modified crops in the 90s, uh, we made a mistake of not being able to communicate effectively to the public what we were doing as scientists. And when the public got, uh, you know, like their own idea of what we were doing, all of a sudden, by the time we realized the power of their advocacy against GMOs, for example, it was too late, and now we're in kind of an impossible dialogue. With and there are many studies that have shown how it's very difficult. Uh, people have taken positions now, taken positions for or against GMOs as if it is a political point of view. There's little scientific, uh, it's very difficult once somebody has cho chosen their tribe uh, mm -hmm. to take them out of the tribe. And I think we need to learn a lot from the mistakes of GMO crops to actually not make that mistake. I know people that is working with gene editing, particularly gene drives or potential for gene drives in, in using it against ticks, for example. Yeah, and gene drives and mosquitoes are a big, big push right, right now. Yeah, and, they, uh, and people that is working in those circles, they are making a huge, a, a very, uh, a huge effort in trying to incorporate the communities in which these things will be released from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So particularly people, people uh, trying to use gene drives for uh, uh, tick, uh, tick control to prevent or reduce the amount of Lyme disease in the U.S. is, is having dialogues with communities for, to make them participate from the beginning and make them feel that if they don't like it, then the project won't be even developed. Uh, the situation with mosquitoes is a little bit more complicated because there are millions of life lost every year, and this is more a governmental level discussion rather than a commu small community discussion. But in the U.S., it's been done right now um, in small communities, particularly with. Uh, and, I mean, and, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, even with mosquitoes in the U.S. Uh, during the elections, there was this non-binding referendum about releasing genetic. Uh, well, this was this was genetically modified mosquitoes, not, necess not not with gene drives, with a different method. But in the Florida Keys and the public was almost 50-50 for or and against. So it was a non-binding referendum, so it just was exploratory. But it tells you how people, I mean, we're trying to do things a little bit different than the, the, the way we did them in the past. So I have a, a lot of hope that we will figure out a way to do it, that the public will realize that our fight against insects is really very similar to a war. I mean, like wars, wow. it is, it is. We're, we're fighting for the same resources with thousands of species every day. That's and like, Yeah, and like in every war, there is not, nothing you do is going to be 100% satisfactory for everybody. There is going to be collateral damage, there is going to be some prices we'll need to pay. Uh, so the moment the public is with us, with, we think, you know, and the moment the public understands that it's not a 100% solution when you talk about pest control, the moment we'll have some progress, but we have a long way to go as scientists to communicate this effectively. Um, so I strongly, I, I'm really happy about this podcast, for example, because this is <laughs> yeah. ways in which you can do that to, to trans, you know, to uh, start talking more and more about the issues uh, and getting scientists closer to the public, which, uh, I mean, the way we structure science is in the U.S. is, is uh, we have a little bit of these efforts, but it's not the best trait of our scientific community. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm even afraid if, if I'm speaking my, if I'm making myself clear. I mean, it's, it's very hard for us to actually, because you know, you keep studying something, some little thing for so many years, and all of a sudden you think it's so obvious, and it turns out that, uh, you know, yeah, if I was born speaking German, I will speak German, and it's so obvious, but if you don't know German, then it's going to be very hard to understand. So we are yeah. in a little bit, so we need people that do the interface, mm -hmm. we need it's translators. The, the fallacy of knowledge, where you, where you have it, and you assume that everybody else has it, and it becomes something that's difficult for you to communicate yes. as a result. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's a challenge that we're going to face now with these genetic control methods. But it's very important to understand that genetic control is not a silver bullet, and without mm -hmm. evolutionary knowledge, like evolutionary clinical evolutionary ecological knowledge and systematics and um, you know behavioral studies all these uh, gene control methods won't be as effective as they could be for example if, if, if we if we release mosquitoes with gene drives it is extremely important for example to know what the population genetic landscape of the insect you're going to release look like otherwise to know the limitations of your technology it's not a silver bullet so um, I think this is a very important opportunity to make people understand that science actually matters and it can save lives. Um, um, yeah, and that this is from the entomology side, but we're facing the similar challenge when it comes to, for example, uh, bacteria, uh, in antibiotic resistance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we are in the insecticide yep. resistant. Mm -hmm. We have the insecticide resistant problem in IPM in entomology, but people in medicine have the, the antibiotic resistant problem. And we have, uh, I mean, is the same. We we share similar challenges. So so one of the ways one of the ways I think is you need to create 
a friendly face to, to something. I, I, th th I would love to see a genetically altered ladybug that doesn't immediately leave my garden when I release them. <laughs> you know? yeah. like, but the, you, could have, you could have mascots that are something that, well, at least I'm saying, sounds simple. Maybe, there, maybe there's a catastrophic downside to this that I couldn't possibly have imagined. Um, but something like that where somebody go, oh, wow, yeah, a ladybug that stays in the garden that doesn't immediately fly off in some random direction before it settles down again. Yeah. Um, yeah, something that doesn't just turn immediately into the that, frankenfish or right, right. where you choose your pitchforks. Something and... <laughs> relatable, immediately useful, and, you know, garden friendly um, might, be, might be the type of introductions that we would start with versus, versus trying to explain the downsides of a gene drive when, when we're, we're talking about, you know, mosquitoes or something like this. Like, because what, what we get a lot of times, too, is feedback from the show and what, when we're sort of media monitoring is that it is the fear factors of science that get um, talked about, get, that get communicated, that become sensational uh, f far, far, far more, if you know, only, compared to the benefits that are going on. So we, we do need, we, you're right, we do need better communication. But, but I think part of that, too, is communicating um, all of the care that goes into things before they're unrolled, which is part of the problem, right? So, uh, for example, the Earth is kind of this giant open system, and so you can't release these genetically modified ladybugs into your backyard you know unless you've figured happen. out how that's going to affect your neighbor's backyard. So uh, how, kind of how does that work that you can um, do assessments on how these new... Uh, modified versions of these pests will, will not affect other ecosystems. I mean, every time we learn, uh, we've introduced a species to fix a problem. Oh shoot, that created more problems. Yeah. We removed a pest, turns out that pest was actually a pollinator, right? So how can we make sure that these individuals are not going to have this kind of domino effect on the ecosystem we weren't expecting? Right, that's a very good question. And actually, uh, there is an entire field of eco eco ecological risk assess assessment when basically it's, it's, it's about assigning probabilities to all these possibilities. And that re the, the problem with, uh, it's a great idea, but it's very um, research heavy. So to, to assign those probabilities, you need to do a lot of research. Uh, and you know how difficult it is to get your research funded today. <laughs> but we need a lot of studies to be able to assert, uh, to, uh, to add probabilities to all these potential effects and then be able to decide, okay, Okay, let's, let's say we do all these studies and there is probability about releasing this particularly genetic way, let's say a gene drive to control certain thing. And this is what can happen, and this is the probability. And, we, uh, and is this better than spraying insecticides, for example? Because insecticides right. are not risk-free either. Yeah, so <laughs> we're not just introducing this where there's nothing that's out there already causing effects that right. are affecting human health and, you know, the... the you know, I live in a heavily agriculture-centered uh, area of California where it's well known a lot of the effects that are on human health from being exposed to the pesticides and chemicals that are used in farming. So being able to you know, remove that with some, anything else, really, that's not hurting and you know, limiting human life would be a huge benefit immediately. Mm -hmm. Right, and so necessarily it's not going to be risk-free, but it's going to be perhaps better than the current we way. Are, yeah, we already yes. have <laughs> negative effects taking right. place now. Yes. If we have a little bit less negative effects, that's, that's a win right yeah. there. That's a win. Yeah. You're going to go with the win. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is some, that sometimes it can be worse, though. It's not, always, <laughs> yeah, it's right. not always best, so we need to know these probabilities. And, um, and right now, I, I, I mean, the ladybug is a great idea, but we're, <laughs> but we're very early. We're in the beginning, so, so we're starting to learn the possibilities of these methods and techniques. I think that in the future, perhaps we're going to be able to do that. But right now, uh, we're, we're kind of like going for a low-hanging fruits, the, 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 the traits that are explained by few genes, or the things that, for example, possess most risks. For, uh, malaria is a very good model to introduce this, because all the, you know, and this is interesting, because perception of malaria, risk perception of malaria in the US. So if you're a US citizen, for example, your, if your assessment of how risky it is is very different than if you are in Africa. And uh, all of a sudden you will think that it's more pressing and you will assign uh, more priority to the problem. So um, because the costs are so high, we're losing like almost a million people every year by yeah. just one disease. And if you add the other diseases, you know, chikungunya, dengue, and all the diseases transmitted by mosquito, it adds up to a lot of people every year. So we believe that I, I think it's a great idea to try to introduce 
the, the, the generic control methods so through the mosquitoes because at least we know that, that the, 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 the costs are really high, the risks are very high, it's human lives. Uh, and then that's an incentive to do this research I'm talking about, to, to calculate uh, the probabilities assigned, uh, assigned to these other potential risks. Um, because you, you, human, uh, loss of human life is usually a motivation for a lot of agencies to put money there, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing is that, um, you know, what we want to do at the end is find out if whatever genetic control or not, I mean, whatever pest control of, we use, we need to decide if we are in a high risk um, you know, a high risk, high probability scenario, low risk, low probability scenario, or in combinations of those. And in many situations, when it comes to ecological cost, we don't know because we don't know the data. So, yeah, so that's why we need a lot of studies, and that's something that some agencies don't like to hear. <laughs> we mean, need more public funding, more research, yes. more studies so we can get the data and we can actually start figuring this stuff out because we are uh, bumping up against, as you said, this war with the insects and food shortages for our global population. And so there is a balancing act that is really, com we're, we're cutting it close in terms of timing. But thank you so much for joining us today. This, this has been so fantastic meeting you and talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Raul Medina's website is medinalab.tamu.edu if you are interested in following up on his research moving forward. This is This Week in Science. I'm going to say a few words very quickly about the show, and then we will get to our last, last bit of the show, right? Yeah. All right, everyone. If you are listening right now or watching live in the audience, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time and your, your attention to entomological science today. This Week in Science has lots of things that we offer to you. Um, we have a calendar that's available right now. I know everybody here at the Entomology Conference just got a beautiful calendar, but twist.org, if you go to our website, you, there's a link for our calendar, which is going to be a coloring calendar. Blair's been drawing all the pictures, and it has science and geek-themed holidays throughout the year. It is a wonderful calendar, uh, and it is available for order now, and we will be mailing those out, hopefully, in the next month to people. So twist.org if you're interested in a calendar. We also have other merchandise that you might enjoy if you head to our Zazzle store, which is linked off of twist.org. We have hats and mugs and phone covers and tote bags and all sorts of fun things. Some of the items we have are fun art from previous Twist Blair's Animal Cor Calendar uh, calendars. We have lumbar pillows with mammoths on them. Yeah. The mammoth lumbar pillow. <laughs> Everybody needs one of those. You want a T-Rex for your cell phone? You can get one. Tortoise, it's there. That's right. Zazzle. <laughs> this Week in Science. Go to twist.org. Click on the Zazzle link to find all of our, our merchandise that does go towards supporting the show. Additionally, we are supported by our listeners completely. We don't have any advertise, advertising support. And donations pay for hosting bandwidth and contractors we need to hire to keep things going because I don't know how to do a lot of the things that need to be done to keep things going. So any amount you are able to give, we have a link on our main page. You can click on, it'll take you to the PayPal donation page. We also have a Patreon community. Click on the Patreon link and figure out your amount of support per episode every month and that helps keep the show going and we have little gifts that we send you as thanks for supporting us on Patreon. You also get to be part of a community that gets inside scoops on cool things that we do, videos, audio that we release. You get little emails from us. It's our little community and it helps keep us going. But if you're not interested in that kind of support, we can always use your help just to get more people listening to Twist. So please use your social networks to help spread the word about Twist. Let them know that you were here at the Entomological Society meeting and hung out and listened to us. Let them know that you can find us on iTunes, on Google, uh, the Google Android Podcast Porter, Portal, Facebook, YouTube, all over the place, and that will help us out. We really do thank you for your support and for listening. We really could not do this without you.
We don't have any music. We I don't were know gonna, where it went. The music went it away. <laughs> the music went away. And we are back. You are listening to This Week in Science. We are back once again. And it is time for our favorite segment of the show where we like to ask people what science has done for them lately. And so I would like to bring up Joanna, who is hosting this wonderful session, to let us know what science has done for her lately. So welcome, Joanna. Thank you for bringing us today. My pleasure. All right. What has science done for you lately? All right. Well, I am a grad student. Um, But more importantly, as somebody who doesn't have a good handle yet on the whole work-life balance thing, um, I don't have a ton of time to eat well. And so the problem is, though, is that I love to eat, and I like to eat good food. Um, So my solution has been these websites that use science to figure out the best way to cook everything and to make it taste great the first time, not the 17th time I've tried to make it. And so, because I'm a science dork, these websites also provide the background into why you need to cook things the way you do, and so that's something that I love. And so, Serious Eats, Alton Brown, America's Test Kitchen, thank you for making me a better cook and letting me eat delicious, healthy, scientifically proven food. (laughs) And that's what science has done for me. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Sure. Every week on the show, we like to read a comment, a note from one of our listeners to remind us all that science is a part of our lives every day in a multitude of different ways. And so food we eat, that is one big way that science is a part. And yeah, I'm going to have to go look at that website and get some recipe ideas because I'm the science kitchen experimenter where the food is usually not good for a few times. (laughs) But it's good. So anyone who is interested in letting us know what science has done for them lately, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Science, and leave us a message. Let us know what science has done for you lately, and we will schedule it to be read on the show. It is time now for Blair. What have you brought for us today? Oh, I wanted to talk about um, delayed gratification. Um, so actually... Speaking uh, of food. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of you may uh, may be familiar with a study from the 1970s. I know we've talked about it on the show before, but it was with a marshmallow, and they sat a child down, and they said, okay, you can eat this marshmallow right now, or if you wait, I'll come back in a few minutes, and I'll give you another marshmallow. You'll get two marshmallows. And they found that four-year-olds were pretty good at waiting up to about 15 minutes for a bigger reward. So that's delayed gratification. Uh, Under four years old, it's a lot harder. Uh, If you ever see this done with toddlers, they shove the marshmallow in their mouth before you finish explaining what actually is happening. That's not funny. That's not like even today. So once they they hit about four years (laughs) old, the human brain is starting to be able to understand delayed gratification, and it's able to delay, the reward center is able to delay that reward in order of a larger reward later. So there's been a lot of experiments done with animals and delayed gratification. The methodology of it gets sticky because they don't, they can't really understand a researcher saying, okay, so uh, dog, uh, you can have one cookie now or you can wait and you'll get two cookies later. No, so it doesn't work. So you have to figure out a way to train these animals to recognize where food is. And a lot of this research has been done with dogs, with parrots, with animals that are considered to have kind of quote unquote higher intelligence as compared to other animals, which usually as the entomologist in the room would know, is usually assigned to vertebrates, even though our invertebrate friends uh, actually have a lot of secrets in the intelligence field. We just haven't quite figured out how to unlock a lot of that because we don't know how to test on them properly. So this new study that I brought today from October 24th from the University of Regensburg, Germany, um, showed ants with self-control. They looked at um, black garden ants and they tested them on sugar rewards and how far they were willing to go for that sugar reward. So the way they did that, they actually took eight colonies, they bred them from wild caught black garden ants and took the captive bred ants from these eight different colonies. They put them in this space, 
essentially just a box, right? And then there was a runway that led to a food reward over a drawbridge. So they actually started with the farthest drop first so that they knew there was food far away. And then they placed a drop right in the middle of their path that was closer. And in different treatment groups, it was either the same sweetness or it was less sweet. And they found that even though the less sweet food option was still good enough to feed them. It wasn't useless food for them. Um, the, the less sweet option, they would actually, a lot of them would forego that to go to the farther food item if it was sweeter. So they were showing signs of uh, self-control, delayed gratification, um, to get to this farther, better food reward. So just to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of the percentages, because that's always the stuff that I get hung up on. Was well, this really statistically significant? And we were kind of debating about that last night. Yeah. So they found that that in when they had the two food rewards were the same, 83% chose the closer option. So they were definitely going for the easier option in large numbers if the food was the same quality. But when the farther food was better, 69% ignored the closer food reward and went to the farther better food. So it does sound like a pretty substantial jump there. Um, and they were, they were definitely showing signs of being able to kind of plan ahead and go, okay, I won't get this food even though it's fine because the farther food is better. Um, and I bring this up for a couple reasons, one being that uh, I know when I'm battling ants in my own home, I'll sometimes try to give them something outside so that they they stay out there and they don't go in. Now I need to know it needs to be as good as the stuff in my house. <laughs> but also... That's right, you just need to leave a big pile of sugar outside. This is, yeah. this, yeah. actually, no, this is actually a strike that happened for real with uh, a friend of ours. Oh, really? Yeah, where, where a large bag of sugar uh, was in the cupboard and was getting attacked by ants. But as soon as they found that, there were no ants anywhere else in the house. And so he was like, I'm not going to move it. There you go. <laughs> just, just leave the, sh leave the sugar in the It's in the back the of the cupboard. Yeah. I'll just not Let use that go. cupboard for anything else. That goes to the ants. They've left the rest of the house. There's none on the kitchen counter anymore. <laughs> Yeah, problem yeah. But yeah, the other side of this is just, um, first of all, we think about animals in, uh, in large groups and colonies like this, uh, not being able to think for themselves very much. And more and more research we com that comes out, it proves they're, they're individuals within a unit and they make their own decisions. But this definitely also showed that, that they, they tested that the ants actually seem to trust their own experience over uh, other ants' experience. So even though they were near ants that maybe have experienced something different, they would do what, what they had experienced and they were more comfortable with at that point. I think it runs into the problem of um, anthropomorphizing ant cognition, and yeah. <laughs> in terms of ants making their own decisions or what they're doing, I think that's um, maybe a, a jump from what they're really doing, which is having different behavioral strategies, where some ants are more likely to be more, uh, uh, I guess, will search more, and other ants will stay with what is known. Right. So are so some ants like... going to continue searching and find that sweeter reward right. and stick with that, whereas others, maybe, they'll, maybe they will just be sticking with the one thing that is close and known as opposed to continuing to search. Right. So and I, that I, would say be... it's, I would say it's search strategy. Yeah, right. and that might be what that 17% was of ants that still went to the farther glob of food, even yeah. though that's, that's there was the stuff ant, closer. I think that's the ant that I would be. Because, because I would be worried less about the one that the rest of the colony is already grabbing, but what if there's another colony further out, yeah. and they find that further away one, then we won't have that anymore. That's right. right. Um, but ultimately, what we're seeing here is that uh, there's a large number of ants in this experimental group that was happy to go longer without food to get the better food, right? So was happy, right? But yes, they, they, they made that jump in the experimental group. So the idea is that just like you tell the toddler, okay, if you wait, you'll get another marshmallow. Through this experimentation, they were telling the ant, okay, if you go farther, you'll get better food. So, And this is what I'm going to do from now on with the ants in my house. I will sit and talk with them and tell them the oh, better sure. food is outside. You need yeah. to go outside. The better food is out there. But really, there's a lot more going on in that little ant brain than uh, a lot of people realize. 
ant social fun. colony brain. We are moving into our final wonderful interview with Dr. Martha Reiskin. If you would please come up to the stage. We had to delay gratification to get to this fantastic interview. Dr. Reiskin is a research assistant professor in applied ecology at North Carolina State University. Her research focuses on using molecular methods to determine the evolutionary history and future evolutionary trajectories of species. (laughs) An overarching theme for Dr. Burford Reiskin's research is to understand how future environmental change or perturbations will affect those evolutionary trajectories of species or communities. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, looking at your research, I see many fish (laughs) in your life, and I'm wondering how the fish lead into entomology for you. It all has to do with love. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, and it's not love for mosquitoes. Um, I actually, yes, I'm very interested in adaptive capacity of species to change. And I fell in love. (laughs) With a man, a human, a vertebrate. Oh, okay. um, yeah, <laughs> not an insect. It's hard to love a mosquito. Um, yes. <laughs> but uh, my husband, um, I met when I was a postdoc, worked on mosquitoes and has this really interesting system with Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, and Aedes albopictus, the invasive species. And um, really interesting research. We fell in love. We came to NC State. And I said, you know, I think you really need to take this one step further and dig down into the genome of Aedes aegypti and see if you can see evidence of rapid evolution. And so it was a partnership in love. And so really, I am a trained evolutionary biologist Um, conservation biologist, and I work mostly with aquatic fish, a little bit with aquatic invertebrates, and so mosquitoes are a a new realm for me. Neat, but but it's not really because your methodology is the same. They have DNA. Everything has DNA, and DNA is what I'm trying to get at, and I'm really trying to see how things when they're presented with a new situation, like an invasive species, or rapid uh, environmental change, um, or species interactions, like the Battle of the 80s, which is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, um, how, how, they, how they evolve and how they adapt, and whether or not that's really, truly something that's heritable. Right. I mean, this is really important. I mean, this mosquitoes are... The, the Aedes aegypti are in, incredibly important for us to understand, especially as climate change is changing environments, and we are actually witnessing them spreading to new regions. That's correct. And they carry disease, and this is a big, yes. this is going to influence human health. That's correct. Yes, Aedes aegypti is a, is a wonderful vector for lots of different diseases. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Very efficient. Um, and in fact, it's better than Aedes albopictus, which is the mosquito that's mostly biting us in the southeast. Um, and, uh, and one of the interesting patterns that's happened with these mosquitoes, and this is why I call it the Battle of the Aedes, is really Aedes aegypti came over in the 1600s to the United States, was responsible for yellow fever uh, outbreaks in the United States, and it had a really nice range. But in the 80s, the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, arrived to Houston and spread and pretty much took over all the habitat and and area for Aedes aegypti. So really all we were left with were these small little islands that are in urban centers or in areas where the less desiccation tolerant um, invading um, Asian tiger mosquito can't live. And so we replaced the, the better vector for yellow fever, for Zika, for, uh, for most diseases except for chikungunya, um, with this other vector. But it's changing. Mm-hmm. And that's the interesting twist to it all is we have now kind of have a better understanding of how that rapid within a decade replacement of the Asian tiger um, uh, of the Asian tiger mosquito to the Aedes aegypti occurred, and now we see it's coming back. And so that's one of the things that we track in our lab is the landscape genetics, the process of spread of Aedes aegypti, but also 
how it how it happened that they are overcoming this competition with Albopictus. Yeah. So is. Is there anything that you can tell us on how no. they are <laughs> how they are overcoming I this mean, competition? I mean, it's not a lot of people out here, so I could probably spill the beans. But yeah, um, <laughs> so what's really it's so bizarre, and this is why I got interested in it because I like bizarre stories and I like interesting um, combat between species. But uh, there was lots of different hypotheses for why. You know, this new mosquito, container mosquito, it's adapted to humans, could replace one that was already present and naturalized here. And, um, you know, they thought about parasite mediated competition. That didn't seem to be the case. They thought, oh, well, maybe the container, you know, there's some sort of competition because they like these little small containers that are all around your house, your mm-hmm. upturned frisbees, um, things that are scattered, trash, that are tires. Um, And there is evidence that there is some differences in which species will do better in these container, in these larval environments, but it was really context dependent. It depended on what the resources were. And so what my collaborators and I um, came to was actually that a female Aedes aegypti, the naturalized species, if she mates with the wrong male, she's sterilized. She'll never reproduce again. And so it's an incredible fitness cost. If you see it the other way around, the albopictus female can mate with the wrong male, but then she can turn around and mate with the correct male and have viable offspring. So you mean the, the, the cross-species mating? Oh, so yeah. So this is right. Egypti female mating with albopictus. Males. It sterilizes her. And that's it. That's the but end the, of her life. But the other way around... It's asymmetric. It's fine. Yeah. The other way around, it's, well, they don't produce any viable, there's no, um, they're phylogenetically far apart, so there's no viable yeah. offspring to, to, con, um, to interspecific mating. But, she's, yeah, but the, the Albopictus female can make the wrong choice and turn around and make the right choice and be fine. And so it's this asymmetric. And it's, almost, it's a little bit analogous almost of, of, of early modern human and Neanderthal. Yes. Where the the, Interesting. the the human and Neanderthal offspring weren't as as viable. Yeah. And so there's no offspring here. So this this female, you know, this Mrs. Aedes aegypti is pissed <laughs> and dead. And you have that's, killed me. That's it. <laughs> so there's strong selection for females to make a choice. And we're finding we found phenotypic my collaborators down at the medical um, the Florida Medical Entomology in Vero Beach found that they could take females that were naive, that had never seen the wrong male, and over time, through about five to six generations, they would stop choosing the wrong male once they'd been exposed to it because of this fitness cost. And so it was so cool, and I really wanted to see if this phenotype difference actually was present in the genome. And so that's where I came in. Because mm-hmm. I love DNA, and I like the guy who was studying it. And so <laughs> that just kind of worked out. And so yeah, so I, I actually dig down in the genome, and I found evidence of um, strong directional selection for this female choosing this of the 80s Egypti females. I gotta know, what is it that sterilizes the female? Is it a mechanical issue? We're still trying to figure it out. It's probably proteins that are in the albopictus male's sperm packet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, insects are weird. Um, And so um, it's probably (laughs) something that just, it just, it ruins it. Yeah, maybe it's some albopictus mate competition factor that's in in that. Yeah, I mean, you know, some some people have thought, well, maybe this is the, the competitive advantage of the... 80s albopictus males. Um, And I just think it's one of those things where, you know, there's been enough time separating, they're reproductively isolated, Mm -hmm. um, and this is just a byproduct of that. Right. So it could be something from sperm competition or something like that in the species. It could be, you know. Backfires outside of the species. Yeah, yeah, Hmm. yeah. Interesting. So, but over five or six generations, this choosing the wrong male goes away. So eventually, these populations, as they overlap, the Egypti females aren't going to be making the wrong choice. And That's so this, correct. this sterilization factor that is probably limiting their spread is going to be minimized. 
That's correct. I mean, there's two things that we think about with Aedes aegypti that we're concerned about. One is that they are more desiccation tolerant. They're probably more adapted to extremes, like extreme flooding and extreme drought than mm -hmm. Albopictus. So that's one concern. So from these urban centers like Miami or um, Palm Beach County, you might start to see some spread, and we have evidence for that spread occurring. Um, the other thing is that they do have this capacity to, when they are sympatric with the other species, to overcome this asymmetric, and we call it satirization. Isn't that cool, satyr, you know, the Greek. Um, so um, they can overcome that, that satirization. And so that's another factor. And, and reminding, you know, people that Aedes aegypti is a superior um, transmitter for a lot of these diseases than albopictus. It's not really what we want biting us. Um, so, I mean, not that we want anything biting us. I wonder if there's something genetically about the desiccation tolerance that allow that is also linked to the um, the higher ability of uh, carrying these disease vectors or being a vector for these diseases. Yeah, it's it, you know I don't know about that. It could be a pleiotropic sort of mm -hmm. pattern. Um, Aedes albopictus, however, is in in most cases a better vector, except for, for a few exceptions of other diseases. So they have mm -hmm. their, you know, the ones they're particularly good at. Yeah, <laughs> one of them's got the blue M&Ms, the other one has the green M&Ms. And they're yeah. mosquitoes, yes. <laughs> oh, no. And they're mosquitoes. But thinking about mosquitoes and controlling them, I mean, mosquitoes mm. are food sources probably very often for the fish and the aquatic invertebrates that yes. you study and in your bats. other life. And bats. And we found recently that they're pollinators. Mm -hmm. And people are talking about these gene drives to sterilize all oh, the yeah. mosquitoes. And I mean, there are a lot of people on this planet who are like, let's just get rid of mosquitoes. Mm. Yeah, Justin's one of them. Yeah. Um, well, I'm on the other I, side. Until I found since, out that they were pollinators, and then... Yeah, yeah. see, that's the problem. Just like I was saying earlier, introducing new species or removing entire species, there's always going to be some unexpected impact. So thinking about your concert, from your conservation mm. side of your, of your work and thinking about this you know, unintended effects or predicting how uh, species are going to... Uh, how they're going to act in the future, their trajectories. I mean, how do you feel about mosquitoes and what we, sh what we should be working on with them? Well, that's a great question. I think it can go a lot of different directions. Um, I think that when you think about these two particular species um, and the cost that they have to human um, disease and human lives, um, it, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, you know, these cost-benefit mm -hmm. um, patterns. Plus, mm -hmm. both of these species are not necessarily, depending on how you count it, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they arrived here. They're right. invasive. So invasive. There, was, there was a time when there were no mosquitoes. We have a lot, of, well, right. there's, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of mosquito diversity. And if you go into our website, we actually track the different types of mosquito diversity that you see across the United States. So that these two are here, um, and, and they're human uh, adapted, um, I, I don't know that I, I can, I don't know that the, you know, what the unintended consequences would be, other than um, limiting um, disease carrying. Now, I, I can see the argument the other way around. We have often, and I, and I work a lot, most of my work is on invasive species and, and trying to find, uh, using those as a proxy for um, rapid environmental change that you might experience with climate change. Um, but we have seen over and over again unintended consequences. Um, and, you know, and, and every time we step in, we seem to kind of, you know, um, unintentionally really mess everything up. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think it, it requires a lot of thought. And, and I think really one of the biggest considerations with the gene, gene drive is really how to drive it in, how to really drive this into the populations or bring them down to levels that are um, where they're really not behaving as such a great vector for disease. And we argue quite a bit on the show about um, 
what is an invasive species, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how far back do you go? Has That's the correct. landscape changed since it That's was correct. an invasive mm -hmm. species? Yeah. And if so, you need to come to my class. I do a genetics on invasive species. We talk about this all the time. Yeah. I mean, we, we refer to Aedes aegypti as naturalized because it's been here so long. Um, and that Allopictus is the invasive species. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's hard to say. I mean, I, and we have lots of species that arrive and never really get established and never become invasive. And so, you know, and there's a lot of language that we use related to that as well that people argue about. Yeah, and then there are some invasive species that come in and are actually very beneficial to ecological habitats where they fill a role that something had been lost from. That's correct, that's mm -hmm. correct. And, and, you know, sometimes we see these host shifts where we see a species where um, the native population has come down, this invasive or what we call invasive has come in and they host shift to it and all of a sudden the native insect is doing much better um, than it was. So, yeah, there's plenty of... A, Bizarro examples. Yeah, I mean, recently had a uh, we recently had a story on the show where there is a researcher, I can't remember his name, but he has uh, postulated he's put forward a book on the idea that um, that we need to maybe think of not necessarily invasive species, but species that are adapted and working with humans, and that are the species that we want to. Uh, see survive going into the future and yeah. instead of conserving all species mm -hmm. maybe conserve the species that are most likely to do well in the future and really yeah. you know hedge our bets with the successful ones oh gosh you know and and I, we we talk about this a lot and i think one of the things that you know when we're talking about climate change and and species changing their range and you know how do we adaptively manage and conserve um, for these species you know as we considering all these things in the context of a global climate change. And I, and I think that, um, yeah, there's, there's just so many wonderful questions you can ask. And, and, and I think, too, that one of the things that we are struggling a lot with is understanding the adaptive capacity um, to change. Um, you know, we may be underestimating or we may not have good measures of, of what that adaptive capacity is. You know, we often talk about genetic diversity. Oh, they have to be really diverse or they just can't evolve. But then we see things where something with really low diversity does a massive host shift, you know. And so we, we really are at the forefront of trying to grapple with how to conserve species in the face of all this change. But, but I can't still make an argument then that we could get rid of the, the mosquitoes that attack humans in at least North America I'm as something you. that was an invasive species <laughs> to begin with. This is good news. This is good news. Okay, I'm probably going to get in all sorts of trouble. <laughs> I am a fish biologist <laughs> who's wearing the entomology hat briefly. Please don't shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> there will be none of that there. None of that here. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us yeah, today to talk you. about your work. It's yeah. really interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. This has been just a wonderful show. We've heard some, from some amazing scientists about a diversity of topics. And it is now time for us to come to the end of our show. We have done it. 90 minutes. We're wrapping it up at the end. I would love to give a shout out to our guests, Dr. Jessica Ware, Dr. Raul Medina, and Dr. Martha Burford Reiskind, to Joanna Eselson. Es Eselson. <laughs> 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 and Rob Dunn, who's not here, and also the Entomological Society of America for bringing us here and allowing us to broadcast and record here at their annual meeting. Also, thank you to those of you who've been here the whole time, and or even just for a part of it, for joining us live in room 605 for this podcast. Thank you so much. And those of you who are watching online, shout outs to those of you on the chat room. Thanks for joining us online. Thanks for everyone's support on Patreon and keeping this show going. And if you're interested in supporting us, you remember you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. You can also help us out simply by telling your friends about TWIS. Share the words! We broadcast live online every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time. Twist.org slash live is where you can find us and join our chat room to watch live. But if you can't watch live, don't worry, it's archived everywhere. You can find us on YouTube, on Facebook, and also the podcast episodes are hosted at twist.org. 
Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is, of course, as she said, available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, and it will come up. Also, we have a mobile-type device app for Twist, the number four droid, in the Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple marketplace For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. And when you're there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here, actually, on Wednesday and not here, but we'll be back on the Internet on Wednesday. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. Thank you for joining us, everyone. We really appreciate you being science. here. Thank you. This week in science. Woo-hoo. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up For those shop, of you that are here, we've got patches and pins and stickers if you would like to come take some swag home with you. With We're also going to be meeting at the... Street Social at 5 o'clock to have a beer if you want to meet us there and just chat. We're also here now. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific Thank you. method for Thanks all for joining us. Really appreciate and I'll broadcast you. my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week, this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. Science is science. science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news, that what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy, we're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy. This week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, I, 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 I. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one 